You may be seeing super investors like Michael Burry and Monish Babrai investing heavily in Japanese companies. And your first reaction may be, hey, why don't I just follow them into these Japanese companies? It's just like any other company, right? Hey everyone, CJ here. Today I want to talk about stakeholder capitalism in Japan. And I'll touch on what stakeholder capitalism is and how it differs from traditional American capitalism. And then I will talk about how the Japanese markets are turning more into a hybrid of both stakeholder and American capitalism. Before you invest in any Japanese company, it's very important to understand the dynamics of Japanese business culture versus American culture. There are some key characteristics that make investing in a Japanese company different than investing in an American company. I read a really interesting article in The Economist covering this topic, and it was new to me, so I wanted to share it with you all too. Okay, let's talk a little bit about stakeholder capitalism. When I think of what a business's true purpose is, when it really comes down to it, it is to maximize shareholder returns. That's it, that's all that matters. But that's not how capitalism is viewed in a lot of parts of the world. And in Japan in particular, we have seen a large scale attempt at making stakeholder capitalism work. Stakeholder capitalism states that a company's sole purpose isn't just to maximize shareholder return. These companies have obligations to their customers, their employees, their business partners, buyers and sellers within their business and society at large. Since World War II, that's how businesses have been generally run in Japan. Of course, it's important to grow private wealth, but companies should do so in a way that benefits the public. Unlike companies that adhere to more of a traditional style of capitalism, these stakeholder capitalist companies can potentially have a much bigger impact than just returning wealth for their shareholders. To me, this brings to mind companies that have a big focus on going green and helping the environment as they make profits. This trend towards stakeholder capitalism is becoming more popular in the US, but it is not by any means widespread. Now there is the question of, is stakeholder capitalism the best way to go about things? Monish Prabhai recently said that it's more important for a business to maximize long-term returns, and then they can prioritize philanthropic efforts with a different vehicle. Before World War II, Japan actually had a more Western style capitalism that was a little bit more cutthroat. But after the war, industrial policy within the country started to favor this stakeholder capitalism. Stakeholder capitalism has worked pretty well for Japan. Japan's one of the richest countries in the world with very low unemployment numbers and relatively little inequality compared to other countries. But there have also been some downsides of stakeholder capitalism in Japan. Chief among these are low growth and slow growth of the businesses and corporate decadence and bloat. So when the country was growing, there was a high quality and stable labor force and their relationship with suppliers helped the country catch up to a bunch of the Western countries like America. There's a quote in the article that reads, the workers wouldn't strike and the company wouldn't fire the employees. So that would work out for anyone. But as I was saying about the tight-knit relationship between the suppliers and the companies, it doesn't necessarily make sense for a company to be so loyal to a supplier if it doesn't directly impact their bottom line. Executives and board members would manage the company more like a head of a family would rather than a representative of a shareholder. Also, historically, there's this concept of cross-shareholding where a friendly firm will purchase a stake in your company to protect you from outside investors and activist invaders. But in the 90s, when Japan's economy started to slow, there were some pretty obvious cracks showing in stakeholder capitalism in Japan. Nowadays, especially in America, it's way less common for you to stay at one company for your entire life. But there is a class of people in Japan called salarymen who do just that. They're loyal to their company and the company is loyal to them. But this trend is actually on the decline even in Japan. The share of non-regular workers went from 20% in 1990 to 40% today. And it's much more likely for these non-regular workers to be young and female. There's also been this downward trend from banks being the main regulators and influencers of Japanese capital allocation to more foreign investment. These foreign investors have way less access and ability to hold the management accountable. So management just hoards cash. If you wanna grow your business, you need to take that cash and reinvest it in your business, or at the very least, return it to shareholders. In this chart, you can see the steady rise of cash and cash equivalents on balance sheet for Japanese companies. So in 2014, the prime minister at the time, Abe Shinzo, implemented some new economic policies. Basically, he encouraged companies to improve their returns on capital and introduce outside executives to the boards. As you can see in this chart, the return on equity for Japanese companies, especially in the past, has severely lagged the rest of the world. 
It does look like it's closing the gap a little bit though. So things are improving on that front. And as we can also see, the share of independent directors on boards is also becoming much more healthy. Over 95% of the firms listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange now have at least two or more independent board members compared to 22% in 2014. So we're also seeing an uptick in mergers and acquisitions. Japanese companies are much less likely to take a poison pill to kill off any activist takeovers. And all of this is coming together to make investing in Japanese companies a little bit more beneficial for actual shareholders. Companies are willing to acquire or be acquired. They're willing to reinvest in their business. And they're obviously more willing to take on more independent shareholders to keep management accountable. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows by any stretch. For instance, independent directors only dominate the board for 6% of listed companies in Japan. On top of that, about 90% of management in big listed firms are from internal promotions. In the cross shareholdings in Japan still account for 32% of all the market capitalization. All that is to say is that management still isn't that worried about the shareholders. One shining example, however, is Hitachi, which is an electronic consumer company. They've implemented a merit-based approach to promotions and pay. It's pretty common in Japan for traditional salarymen to be judged more heavily on the amount of hours they put in rather than the quality of work that they produce. So all in all, it does look like Japan is moving to a more shareholder friendly direction, but they do have a long way to go. And on the other hand, a lot of American companies are going to be moving more towards the stakeholder capitalism. So what does that mean for us as investors? To me, it seems that the number one important factor is understanding management. If you find a Japanese company that looks profitable, but you either don't understand the management's actions or don't have access to it, then it could be a little risky investing in that company. It's easy to invest in a so-called value trap where you think that value will be unlocked, but because management isn't taking the appropriate action or the action that you think they should, the value just stays locked up in cash, for instance, on the balance sheet. On the other hand, Monish Pabrai has recently been building a stake in Shinikin, where he believes that the management is top notch, is going to continue to compound capital at a high rate for a long time. So for Japanese companies, just like any other companies, it's really important to start with the micro. If you can understand the business really well, and you can understand the management really well, then in all likelihood, it's going to turn out to be a good investment. But just keep in mind all of these other factors for Japanese businesses that you may not necessarily account for for American businesses. Speaking of Monish Pabrai, if you enjoyed this video, you might enjoy this video over here describing his new investment philosophy. This is the philosophy he's used to find Shinikin and a bunch of other long-term compounders. I hope that helped illuminate some of the differences between business in the West and business in Japan. Now, I'm no expert on the Japanese economy, but this is what I've learned from this Economist article. For more in-depth information, please read this article in The Economist if you have access to it. I will leave a link to it in the video description below. Please let me know if you have any special insights into Japanese businesses or markets. I'm definitely trying to become a lot more familiar with that market. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this content, and I will see you next time.